Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We finally made it this week. Along with Jim Garrity of National Review, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. As usual, we start with the good. Out in the great state of Oregon, we've talked over time, even all the way back to last fall, when the governor's campaign was in full swing about the very bizarre allegations involving Democratic Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber and his fiance, and the access that she had with special interests and so forth. And this is essentially blowing up big time in the governor's face right now. This is from the Oregonian. In one of the most surreal days in Oregon political history, the state's top Democratic leaders called for Governor John Kitzhaber to resign and the governor vanished from public view. With support of even allies evaporating, the ability of Kitzhaber to remain in office appeared less viable by the hour. The day started with Senate President Peter Courtney and House Speaker Tina Kotak meeting Kitzhaber, a fellow Democrat, for (coughs) breakfast and telling him it was time to step down. Later in the morning, Secretary of State Kate Brown, next in line if he does resign, released a statement calling her interactions with the governor the day before strange, bizarre, and unprecedented. Then-Treasurer Ted Wheeler pressured the governor to resign, calling the situation untenable. So, Jim, uh, it looks like it's one of these situations where he's holding out till the very last second, but the handwriting is clearly on the wall, and a corrupt governor will be removed from office, which apparently will make both parties happy in Oregon, which ought to be applauded. Yeah, look, there's a couple of reasons this is the good martini today. <laughs> On one, it's terrible that uh, that this, you know, uh, seemingly, ex- at the very least, extremely unethical behavior and potentially criminal behavior is going on between the governor and his fiance. I went out to Oregon last fall. It was kind of like, you know, what, what is the mystery of Oregon? How did this state turn into this way? Because, yes, it's got... Portlandia and all the kind of crunchy hippies drinking their organic quinoa micro brews and all that kind of stuff. But there's also a lot of Republicans out there. And it's a state where Republicans really had not been competitive for a long time. They came kind of close in the 2010 governor's race. And what was interesting about this one, particularly after the uh, health insurance exchange flopped, there, there really was no serious impact on Kitzhaber. And I kind of wanted to make the point that, like, look, for, for liberals who claim to believe in good government, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on an exchange that never works is bad government. Why are you guys so so cool with that? And the answer I, I pointed out, the progressive does not mean politically aware, um, and that most people just kind of shrug at that sort of thing. Well, here we have another problem, which uh, there, there shouldn't be a pro-corruption viewpoint. Uh, and of course, Republicans, for obvious reasons, thought it was it stunk to high heaven to have the first lady doing a uh, a consulting business with people who had business before the state government, you know, for most people, what you get paid as the, the, the governor's, you know, the idea of outside income coming to the first lady is usually problematic if it involves anything involving government policy. Well, the governor and his fiance thought that was hunky-dory. The press out there finally did some serious digging into it, managed to you know, file FOIA requests and things like that, and found that she made quite a bit of money from these green energy groups that were trying to influence state policy and things like that. And the governor insisted there's nothing wrong here, there's nothing wrong here. It's now become very transparent that, yes, this is a case of people buying influence by going through the first lady. So a little bit of credit to the Democrats out there for recognizing this is not acceptable. The blue wall of silence, you could say, that Democrats usually have for each other is there. I I know that the national media uh, doesn't seem to be having an overwhelming level of interest in this. And I think there's a great lesson for us to point out to say, look, a lot of people who claim that they're, you know, trying to help out uh, green causes are in it for the other kind of green. (laughs) On to uh, the first bad martini here. Uh, The president has had a difficult week, but you wouldn't necessarily know it. Yesterday, a lot of talk, a lot of buzz, you might say, over this BuzzFeed video of the president trying to be hip and relevant and cool to millennials to get them to sign up for Obamacare. It's a little bit hard to translate to uh, the radio side, but uh, here's just a snippet of it. We hear the, you'll hear the president taking some selfies and uh, talking to himself in the mirror. Prune. The deadline for signing up for... The deadline for signing up for health insurance is February... February... Not like any other Wednesday. That's not right. Wednesday. February... Man. Wednesday. February 15th. So, Jim, in addition to the president 
basically looking at himself in the mirror in a bunch of different poses and uh, eating cookies and pretending he's making basketball shots. It turns out that this video was shot on Tuesday, which is the same day we learned of the confirmation of the death of Kayla Mueller at the hands of ISIS and also the day that we essentially hightailed it out of Yemen. So obviously the president's got to keep a lot of balls in the air, but it doesn't look like this one's all that serious. No, I discussed this on Greta last night, and there was kind of an interesting discussion that came out of uh, the green room, which is that the White House really thinks that it can kind of micro-target these sorts of messages. Allegedly, this is designed to get people to sign up on healthcare.gov. Um, I don't think people really remember much about um, healthcare.gov after that video. I think they just remember the president doing the silly things and making the silly faces and, and things like that. You know, the idea, well, we're going to do this and the stoner millennials will, will look at it and go visit healthcare.gov and it won't really mind us. But I think there are a lot of people who just find this beneath the presidency. And Charles Krauthammer had said last night, it's kind of hard to talk about this video damaging the dignity of the presidency when last week the president was talking to a woman who was famous for being in her uh, bathtub full of Fruit Loops. We kind of chuckle at this, but like there was a time Kennedy wouldn't do this. Right. Jimmy Carter wouldn't do this. FDR wouldn't do this. You know, there was a some people speculated, oh, it was a, a turning point when Richard Nixon taped an appearance on laugh in saying sock it to me or something like that. I, I do think that when you're president of the United States, people see you as kind of a symbol of the country, that there probably ought to be some limit. And, and this pre- what's fascinating is this president it basically is very much, you know, particularly since the midterms. In fact, one of his, you know, things he says in that video is YOLO, you only live once. This sense of like, hey, I don't care what anybody else thinks of me. But you're the president of the United States. You should care what other people think of you. You don't see Angela Merkel doing this sort of thing. You don't see David Cameron. You don't see, like, there, there's something really undignified about this. Then you point the timing of it and the fact that this was, you know, like, you could argue that, well, look, any day of the year, something bad is happening to, you know, to Americans somewhere. Um, but this, and so there's never a good day for him to do something that silly, which to me was the answer is don't do something that silly. In this case, this comes, it reminds us of everything when he went golfing right after announcing the beheading of an American, you know, he just comes across as a guy who's either mentally checked out or just not that into the working part of the job. I think it was Stephen Miller compared him to Brian Williams. And he said, they're more interested in the goofing around parts that come with being a celebrity than the actual work they're supposed to be doing in the job. You hate to say that your generation's better than the one follows or the one that came before, but uh, our generation has its issues and had its issues, Jim. But between the baby boomers who are largely destroying the country and the millennials who don't seem to care, I like the Gen Xers are looking pretty good right now. Call me a crazy, you know, uh, cultural warrior here, Greg, but you know what? This is stupid. (laughs) This is stupid. And if you're a millennial who thinks this is awesome, you're stupid too, okay? (laughs) And when I was growing up, this was not a stupid country. All right, so to everybody who looks at that and thinks, oh, that's so awesome, it's so hilarious, he's making wacky faces, yellow. No, you're stupid. Stop making America stupid. That's my closing message before the crazy martini. (laughs) And that would have been the crazy martini, except for this. Jim, you and I were largely forced to watch the State of the Union. We encouraged most other people not to watch it. But uh, if you did, you might have noticed a couple people nodding off. That's not all that uncommon. But now we know why. A Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg appeared to fall asleep during the speech. She was giving a speech at George Washington University this week and said that uh, the reason she dozed off is that she wasn't 100 percent sober. She says the audience is awake because they get to bob up and down and applaud and so forth. But we have to sit there as stone faced, sober judges. But she says, quote, at least I wasn't 100 percent sober because we had gone to dinner before the State of the Union and Justice Anthony Kennedy brought the wine. I wasn't going to drink wine, just sparkling water. But the dinner was so delicious. I needed wine to accompany it. The best part is from Justice Anthony Scalia, who was on stage with her at the time and said, that's the first intelligent thing you've done. Greg, are you really that angry with her? No, I sympathize with her. Do we really blame her? (laughs) You and I are at home and we can we can yell, oh, that's bull. Or, you know, we can have all all the the Joe Wilson moments we want. Uh, She makes a good point that she's not even allowed to stand up and applaud very much or or anything like that. It would be seen as her, you know, breaking the decorum and the reputation of the uh, Supreme Court. So getting hammered really isn't that, you know, (laughs) that much. We do have to revise that old saying, I'm sober as a judge, though. (laughs) When you say that now, you got to say, no, I'm sober as a judge. At least eight of them. And the other thing is, I just kind of note, Greg, I mean, like, you, for, for most people in politics, this is a, potentially a very big deal. For for her, look, what, she going to get fired? You know, it's not like you can go to her boss and say, you know, 
Justice Ginsburg is behaving inappropriately. We think she has a drinking problem or something like that. She spoke for a lot of us that night, I would say. And so uh, I'll let it go, Justice Ginsburg. It, it, we understand this happens. You know, Jim, we were talking right around the time of the State of the Union that lawmakers should get flasks of non-alcoholic beverages so they could participate in the drinking game in the chamber during the speech. Perhaps Ginsburg, you know, she says it all ended at the dinner table. Maybe she was, you know, taking a few sips early on. Uh, during the speech from her own flask, concealed under the robe, of course, and, you know, had a little too much. I was just saying, does it really need to be non-alcoholic? Maybe That's... a strong incentive for presidents to keep it short, you know. <laughs> kind of like they used to cut off beer sales halfway through the third quarter, you know, for football <laughs> games and stuff like that. Maybe if you're a president, you don't want the speech to drag because the crowd get a little rowdy and stuff like that. You know, there's a, <laughs> there's a fight in the upper deck and, you know... The vendors running around, or, you know, come on, last call, be here, you know, that kind of stuff. If we're going to give up the decorum of the presidency, let's give up <laughs> all the decorum, right? I'm not sure that's the answer. But, you know, if, if it's like Cleveland, then all the flasks will end up getting thrown at the president by the oh, yeah, we don't do that. last yeah. bit of the speech. So, sorry, Cleveland, but it's true. Anyway, Jim, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you on Tuesday. See you Tuesday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Jim will be back on Tuesday. I'll be here on Monday with Andrew Johnson of National Review for the next Three Martini Lunch.